Okay, welcome to episode seven of Gloved. Um, today the episode is going to talk about an awful lot. We've got a player here, we've got Carl Akimi, really happy to have with us. Um, fantastic football career, plenty of obstacles, tremendous journey. Um, you guys might know what he's been through recently. Well, a brief outline of what he's been through recently, but we're really going to get into depth um, of an amazing career and some real life changes that he's, he's gone through, going through, written about. Um, yeah, but no better way than to talk to the man himself. So, Carl, thanks for today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking to you and, and getting into it. Yeah, me too. Welcome. Welcome. Super excited. Um, super excited. Super eagle. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I like how you got that in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, Carl is, um, you know, English Nigerian, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right, yeah. Uh, that's got a bit of coolest name for a football team ever. I think You're buzzing off that yeah. name. I love that name. Super easy. It's a bit, yeah, it's got like a nice ring to Great it. Great ring to it. So you know, but welcome. I think uh, you know, as Joe said, um, there's lots, lots for us to talk about. And you know, I think when when we talk about the game and we talk about football and sports, but for you know, for us today, this is you know about the game of life, and so. You know, let's uh, you know, let's let's get into it. Um, interestingly, uh, you two kind of connected by uh, one of those things again, just by chance. You know, yeah. chance meeting. Um, you know, tell us about you know the the chance meeting that you two had a couple of years ago. Well, I'm a, I'm good friends with Matty Murray, who you're obviously good friends with. Yeah. Career paths crossed. Um, News broke. I've always known about you as a goalkeeper, never knew you personally, but obviously news broke about um, Carl having to retire, going through um, treatment for leukaemia, which shocked the footballing world, shocked the goalkeeping world, um, shocked me as well, you know? It was like, phew, that's a guy I know, that's a guy who I, a, lot of, a lot of people I know think a lot of him. Um, but I was in Christie's in Manchester, so um, uh, my wife's mum was, was poorly. Um, we just moved her onto the ward, and uh, I just heard this big booming voice, and I, I recognised it. And I was like, "That's Big Matty. What are you doing here?" And he said, "Oh, I've come to visit Carl." I was like, "Oh, oh mate. Well, sending my best. You know, obviously, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to surround him. I'd imagine he's got a lot going on." He, he said, oh, "He said he'd speak to you, but if you to pop in." So I was expecting to go on a huge journey through the uh, through the hospital, come and see you, and you, you were two doors down. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. Um... I remember my mum saying, should I have just seen Joe Hart? And then I sort of me just thinking, yeah, mum, you don't really know that much about football, like maybe you were mistaken. And then obviously I remember you speaking to Matt here and then it's like, Joe's, out, Joe's outside, is he all right to come in? I'm like, yeah, of course, uh, bring him in. But yeah, like Joe said, I kind of never knew Joe, but kind of felt like I knew him, just like we had sort of mutual- Mutual friends, friends and contacts and-, and sort of remember him being at Shrewsbury. I think I remember playing against, I played against him and I was on loan at Shrewsbury and then I think I remember playing against you even as a youngster maybe, but I kind of, we knew similar people. Yeah. So I always kind of felt like I knew him without really- Without meeting. Really, yeah, meeting yeah. really, yeah. A chance of, you know, meeting, meeting that way. But here we, here we are, yeah. here we are, which is, uh, which is great. So, you know, it's, it's time for you to, to tell us you know, you've had a very interesting career and, 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 you know, for me, Carl, it's like obvious, you know, we've just started, you know, at, at that place, but I think it's going to the other place of, you know, your career on its own, independently of what's been going on in the past, you know, two or three years has been of interest, you know, you, and, and like a lot of the people that we have on, you know, we do look at, um, how does, your career and your life help somebody else? How does it help the young player who, you know, is, is trying to make it to the top, is trying to get the most out of themselves for the sport? So, um, so you know, tell us why, why a goalkeeper? That's always the interesting one for me, because, you know, do you start off as a goalkeeper? No, no I, don't think any, I don't think any of us did really, did we? <laughs> we all ended up, uh, I started out as a striker. Oh, not another uh, one. And then I was actually at Villa when I was, I, I started out 
I started as a striker, then I'd always go in goal because I'd always get put in goal because I was just better in goal than a striker. Um, and then sort of went to Villa as a 10 year old. Um, and Villa was my club as well when I was a youngster. So um, I was there till 10 to 13 and then it just got a bit too serious for me. Um, I didn't enjoy going. I didn't enjoy the pressure of it. Um, and then just wanted to play football with my friends, to be honest. I was hearing about what's going on in Sunday yeah. football and then just felt like I was missing out. Like they the same as me. Like. Yeah, and then um, sort of left Villa and then went back to my Sunday league team and started playing up front again. Scoring goals? I was quick enough. That I was quick enough to get onto the end of the ball, whether what I'd done with it after, um, I didn't even know what I was doing at times. But yeah, I, my friend uh, had a trial at Wolves and they needed a goalkeeper, so I just sort of went along really and then got signed from there. And yeah, it was, um, it was a bit of a, I had a probably different. Uh, way that I came into the academy because I was never coached. We had a goalkeeper coach, that was all we had. Um, yeah. But he trained uh, eight-year-olds right the way through to 15-year-olds. Okay, yeah, so it was... Was Mike Stowell doing it? Mike Stowell did do it, yeah, but the one session that I did with Mike, I got injured <laughs> and then got carried off. So that was my only actual goalkeeper session that I, I took part in, really. So um, I would uh, sort of came into sort of, sort of technical goalkeeping work quite late and I, it was... It wasn't easy for me, uh, from like 16 to... In what way wasn't it easy? Um, I was effective in games because I could make saves and I'd, I'd come for crashes, but in training or anything technical, I just didn't have the technical capabilities to... If the ball was straight at me, that would probably be the worst thing for me because yeah. I'd rather just make a reaction. But I didn't have the tools really to uh, sort of handle the ball, uh, the right techniques to um, position my body and, and stuff like the tedious things that you don't necessarily see on the, on the pitch because you tend to make it look easier than it actually is. That's, for me, like, that's, people can get lost in the art of, of the technique. It's, but, like, you must see it nowadays. Like, there, there's no one technique to football, whereas growing up at our age, there was a way to be you yeah, know, there was a way to get beat. It was all right. You were technically fine. Now the best keepers in the world, like Manuel Neuer, like I have no idea what he's doing. Like you can't yeah. replicate what he does. Exactly. And he's, you know, he's captain to the World Cup final. Even De Gea, he's back. His his weight's back, but he's just so effective. So, but at that time, how did you handle going out and doing the games? But you know, your like our lives then was day to day. It was trained. Like I only really cared what my People might, I didn't really like, yeah. I did well on a sun, Sunday or Saturday in the youth team. It was great, but I wanted people to rate me. That's what I found difficult um, because I, I got involved with the first team as well, uh, quite young. How old are you at this point? Um, well, Wolves had gone up and I think I was, must have been 17, 16 right. to 17. I was just on the bench really. Who, who are the first team keepers then? Matt Murray would have been a goalkeeper and Michael Oakes yeah. and maybe Paul Jones, I think, was there as well. Right. Um, but I think there might have been a few injuries and I ended up being on the bench for seven games, so I ended up training a lot with the first team. And um, that's when it really showed that I technically wasn't up to standard and that's kind of where you said the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. That's kind of where I'd get found out. So even though I was looking good, with the 17s on a Saturday, mm. it kind of didn't matter because when I got to the, the on Monday and training with the first team, I'd let stupid goals in. Right. Like I might make a great save, but then I would might, uh, every session this would be, yeah. every, every yeah. session I'd make a mistake. So you could pull one out of the top corner, but one would go straight through you. Yeah, straight through me, yeah, straight through me. Because the, the pace of the, the pace that, yeah. the, the, uh, the pace that a 16 year old hits the ball at and a, a, a full, a 27 year old man hits the yeah. ball at, we were, you had like people like Paul Lintz who had done everything in the game. Yeah. But he's totally different and that's kind of where I really struggled and it really took a lot of time, um, a lot of self-doubt kept on happening no matter how, no matter what I said to myself to say that today I'm not going to make a mistake. Right. It just happened again and it happened again. So it was important for me just to keep stepping on the bus every day right. and then keep trying 
keep working on technique. Uh, we had uh, Bobby Mims, our goalkeeper coach, and we had like a different sort of array of goalkeepers. Matt Murray was good technically, mm -hmm. but really good at crosses, uh, really like a dominant presence. And then we had Michael Oates, who's really technically, technically really good at strike a ball really well. So it was just a fact of me trying to learn and trying to pick things up. And I actually remember, the, I think we was on a tour, I can't remember where we was. I just remember one day it just clicked. Yeah. I just started catching things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like... You probably weren't thinking. It was probably a day when you had something else on your mind other than football. Yeah, and it just... Because when you go in just like, oh, football, I've got to catch the ball. But like the, all of a sudden you, 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 yeah. you're smashing your hands against the ball. Yeah. And when, like, I don't know. So it just clicked? It just clicked, you know, and after all the sort of little bits of work that you kind of do in the little drills, and when you do, like, go into goalkeeping, you actually realise how technical it really is, like your, your feet being in the right position, your head moving yeah. at the right speed, your, your hands being in the right position, everything kind of has to be in line for you to catch the ball and it's just it just became a lot more comfortable I felt a lot more comfortable when the ball was coming towards me and then it just kind of evolved from there where I technically started to improve and then that kind of showed when I was starting to train with the first team because I started to make less mistakes and we always always made made mistakes but it just started becoming less often good so so it, I mean you've mentioned some very good names there and in terms of you going in and making those mistakes were you looking at them thinking i want their spot what was the ambition at that time probably not i weren't looking at them uh, taking us but i just felt like i was far away at the time i think until um until i got to maybe 19 or 20 that's when i kind of thought it was a possibility um just because i felt like physically I started to mature into a man and I felt that, okay, I might not be technically better than these, but physically I might be able to, I might be able to start catching them. And I think that's when we started going back to pre-season and I was just, I just come back in really good shape and I felt fit. I felt fit and strong as well. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of felt that, okay, then I, athletically I might be able to, match it or if not be better and then that's kind of where I kind of felt that I still not, might not be in prime position to take your place but people are starting to look now that yeah you're looking like a real athlete and right. th there's something could be there and I kind of that's when I kind of felt that I could start to compete then. So how are the other keepers with you because obviously you're coming in with like you said sounds like raw ability. Yeah. But you think has a question mark over you, but now as a senior keeper, like raw ability at 16, 17 is a brilliant foundation because we can all make someone, you know, if with the right attitude, you can become a goalkeeper. It doesn't matter if you can do the perfect six volleys, if you can make the saves, but how were they with you? Because I think that's important now. Me as a senior keeper, I see young keepers coming to train with us and the majority of the goalkeepers, they come with a great attitude. They come with an attitude to learn. They don't come with an attitude of, like Jamie asked there, were you thinking I'm going to take your spot? Not many kids come in with that actually. They come in with, I'm going to see how it works. I'm going to see what relationship. I'm going to see if people like me. Um, but I think it's really important for senior keepers how you mould a young keeper because they, not, there's, there's so few talents now that are 16, 17 are ready to play in the first team. That's why 16, 17 year olds don't play in first teams because they're not ready yet. But they need to be helped and they need to be progressed. Some people progress ready at 18, some are 20, some are 24. But I think the, the senior players are so important now. So you said you, you had Matty who had these attributes, you had Michael Oakes with these attributes. How were they with you? How did they help you? Yeah, they were brilliant. Um, Matty was always someone that I kind of looked up to anyway. Um, I remember sort of watching Matt, Matt play and um, just his physical presence on the pitch was just incredible. It was probably still one of the best cross takers right. I've ever seen. Right. You just people just bounce off him. Um, so I just tried to take bits from his game. Oaksy was very te very technically sound and very just a calm head as well. Matt weren't mind me saying this before games he was very jittery. Could be throwing up 
in the right. in the change rooms. He'd, yeah. But then he'd come out and be fine. But um, they were both really good, like incredible. Um, Matt was always there to help, and had kind of always been there, even after I'd become yeah. an adult. I could ring Matt mm. whether I was out on loan again, and um, I'd be questioning why I'm out on loan, and then he'd be on the and end of the phone and they just try and give me little pointers without making me feel under yeah. pressure yeah and Oaksy was the same he just he'd try and teach me things that he'd yeah. been taught as well yeah. and that was massive for me because i didn't felt feel like they were laughing at me or look mm. sniggering at me like thinking yeah. oh, what what is he doing mm. they seen that i was raw but seeing that I actually wanted to learn and actually want, worked hard. And I think that was always something I wanted to do. And like what you, you're yeah. talking about is that as long as I can see that you want to learn, yeah. I'll give you, I'll tell you anything you want to know. I'll always give you little pointers. Yeah. I don't want to tell you too much because I just want you to, not because I don't want you to learn because so, too much, sometimes too much information doesn't really yeah. work. Yeah. If I can just have a quick, quick word in your ear before set, before we start the next set yeah. and then just try and do that throughout a session and then we can talk about the session afterwards mm -hmm. yeah. and anything else I, like I'd always let the keepers know that if you want to talk to me about anything mm -hmm. just just talk to me here's my number mm -hmm. call me about anything we all go through it I'm, you made a mis if you made a mistake in the, yeah. the 18s um, at the weekend okay then come show me the goal we'll go and have a look at it keepers are very um, I, I would say are, are quite unique in terms of that's where you get the goalkeepers union from because you do want to help each other whereas outfield players don't really have that that kind of um, that nurture that nurture it is a like you can be as strong as you want it's a vulnerable position mm. and you'd have to have some head on you not to realize that like we've all there's with every job there's some sort of insecurities but like there's a lot with the goalkeeper and you do need and it is like so many outfielders like you joke about it but like you sat there having your dinner Friday night for a game trying to watch a game someone who you don't even know is on the telly lets a dubious goal in bang <laughs> Carl what, what's he doing there yeah, yeah. Like, and you're like Tough, man. Like, yeah, he's yeah. trying. Like, he didn't do it on purpose. You're getting the blame for what yeah. everyone else is doing. It's kind of like you should you should be the 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 information the bearer of what's going on in the whole goalkeeping world. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but immediately like I just leaped to anyone's defence. Yeah, it could, it could be the the worst goal ever. I'm like, well, why is no one blocking the shot? In place? Mm. <laughs> I shut up. Like, no, yeah. why is why is no one blocking the shot? That's in place? that's the union. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Immediately backs up, so you just want to protect. And there are some keepers like I've worked with some that are just like, you know what? You're an idiot. You yeah. do what you want to do. I've tried. Go your own way. We're humans too. Everyone's different, but it just seems that everyone kind of gets that we we need to kind of stick together. And I think yeah, like like Joe said, the majority do want to learn and are willing to help, even if there's a rivalry against another goalkeeper. Yeah. It, it's normally sort of friendly rivalry, but that's not all the time. Sometimes there is a, a little bit of need or a little bit of edge. Right. You know that he's gunning for you or he doesn't want, he, you can feel it, can't you, sometimes, but he wants you to make a mistake. Yeah. And I kind of never had that feeling with any other goalkeeper because I hate, hated the feeling when I made a mistake. Were you thinking, oh, that's the opportunity for him now. I've let him, you know, I've, I've created you, an you can You can sense when you've given someone a, a sniff. Right. You can sense when your place is really under, under threat. Like, you can sense it, but... And, it, and fair play, like, that's, that's how we get in. You get in from someone... Yeah, exactly. It's like, a, it's strange. It's, just, it's like an atmosphere kind of just yeah. comes down on the training ground and then all of a sudden, you know you're under pressure. Yeah. You walk in and you feel like, Something's changed. Isn't it? As soon as you hear, just mind if I have a word with you from a, any member of management, you're like, <laughs> yeah, here we go. I mean, there's several things that give opportunities, aren't there? Form, injuries. Um, you know, for for you, it seems like your career was you were always waiting for somebody else to um, to open that door for you. It didn't. It, for me, it didn't feel like it was like, right, Carl's in, he's my man. A million percent, yeah. Everyone, everyone has a different path and mine probably happened a lot later than I wanted it to. Right. 
um, I felt like I was kind of on the brinks of ready, being ready to play and then sort of going out alone again. But at the time, it was really frustrating because I'm sort of like, why am I going out alone again? But then actually when I look back, when I came back to Wolves... How many loan moves did you have? I think there was nine altogether. Nine? Yeah, and I kind of went from Accrington uh, in the conference, Stockport, then sort of worked my way up Charlton, um, I think Sheffield United, Adonis, not naming more, but then they'd send me out again. Um, so it kind of felt, it did feel like that. It kind of felt like we'd get to pre-season and uh, Wayne Hennessy was the number one yeah. at the time. Uh, maybe Han Marcus Hanneman was there as well, or Doris de Vries. And we came back to pre-season feeling good, feeling sharp. And then it was that pull again. Yeah. Uh, you're looking really good, but I'm going to go with Wayne and Marcus. And it would be like, just deflated again, because I felt like I'd done enough to be, not maybe not start, but be on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will be, yeah, you're going out alone. And that kind of kept on happening until um, I think we got relegated uh, under Mick. Right. Um, and that's kind of felt when I kind of felt like I got my chance on uh, merit. Like I was there because I was playing because I, I was, the, uh, in my opinion, the best there, the best keeper there. I'm not saying I was better than any other keeper, but I was the best at the time. You're that's allowed it. to say that here, yeah. by the way. <laughs> I kind of felt like I was the best at the time and I was playing because I was playing well and uh, no, there was no other reason why I was playing. Right. Um, but it kind of took a long kind of road of going out and learning. What did you learn from loan? Um, I just got experience, you know, which was invaluable really because I'd made so many mistakes on loan. Um, I remember playing against Shrewsbury where I made a big rick against Joe. I'd uh, learnt my lesson of uh, rolling the ball back without checking who's behind me. <laughs> um, and yeah, I got punished. That was last minute as well, uh, last minute of the game. What was the score uh, at that point? I can't remember the game. It, we were drawing or, yeah. or winning. And you've rolled it out? Yeah, yeah, I rolled it out last minute. Then someone ran behind me and then I didn't check who was behind me. Was it Luke? No, nah, it weren't Luke Rogers, no. Nah. I would never have yeah. done it Luke Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, I, and that was a, just lessons like that. Um, I remember Glenn Hoddle saying to me, if, if, I, if that happens in 10 years' time, you've not learnt your lesson. Um, and then being at Stockport uh, was another one for me that um, started off well and kind of having a bit of a dip in form, like, dip, not a dip in form, I was just younger making mistakes really that's what I was probably sent there. For. What was the information you were given when you were going out on loan? Go, go and play games, go and get experience um, and I think that's what kind of happened in the earlier stages and when I got to Stockport um, I was in Manchester, uh, I didn't really enjoy being here. Yeah. Um, I was kind of on my own, I was, I was in digs which there were lovely people to fair but it just wasn't comfortable for me right. um, and at that, when I'd come back, I think I broke my finger, which I felt quite relieved at the time, to be honest, because I just thought, I can go back. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I thought, I'm going to do my best never to come back here again. And then it just kind of, not that I never worked hard, it just, you can, I feel like there's always points in your career where you just start to kick on another level. And I don't know if that's through just information or a bit of hurt, a bit of pain. And then I kind of felt like I didn't want to come back. And after that, things started to move. And then I started to go, I started to go to clubs to get experience as well, but to do well there. Right. And um, that's when I kind of felt that the loan's done for me. And looking back now, sort of when we were going again, when we were speaking to the younger keepers, yeah. and then it was probably easier for me to go out and learn then because of the system, but it was, I uh, went on loan to like, QPRs, Leicesters, Sheffield United's, and I felt quite privileged now to say that. I know a lot of people don't always look at them as um, opportunities as well. It's usually that, oh, I've got to go out on loan. And I think there's a mindset, isn't there, to, you know, to take an advantage of, of that for you. Did, you. did you have any loans? Like, I see this as, a, this as a successful loan for a goalkeeper. Did you have any loans where the club went, um, 
you're going back, but we're going to try and sign you. Um, there was the only one that I really remember um, was I, I'd never gone out alone for that a, a period of time. Really, it'd always been a month, yeah. two months, three months. But probably Middlesbrough was my most enjoyable and successful alone. Yeah. Right. And then I kind of got injured, but it was always, I kind of never felt like I was on loan long enough. So you had no season long loans? No, no season long loans, it was always three month loans. So I never kind of felt that I had that, yeah, we'll, we'll sign you. And I kind of never had that feeling. It's probably Middlesbrough and QPR were probably my best loans. Yeah. But it was always kind of tinged that I was going back to Wolves anyway, and that's what it was going to be. Um, but I kind of never had the, the thought, the fact that someone was actually going to sign me. So whether that was a, a, a slight on what I was doing or the fact that I was on loan for a reason. I wasn't on loan because they were doing well necessarily. I was on loan because their first team keeper was injured yeah. or they were really struggling, struggling right. in the league. So, but I remember being at uh, Doncaster and then that's kind of when I kind of had enough of being on loan. And I just thought, I was probably about 23, 24. And I just, I didn't want to move around anymore. I just wanted to be settled. I just wanted to, wherever I was playing, I just wanted to live there yeah. and not live out the back of my car and sort of driving up and down the motorway. So I'd never really felt that comfortable to stay a day when I was a day off because I want to go home. And that's kind of when I thought, I've just had enough. I need to know what's going on, going on at Wolves. And, Luckily, that's when I actually got my chance. All right. I think a, a lot of goalkeepers, um, you either get away with it in your career or you have a, a number of them that have an impact on, on your momentum. What was that like for you? Injuries is something that I dealt with quite young. So I had injuries. I was injured pretty much for a year straight. Is that your name? I had a surgery on my knee when I was, I think it was about 18, 19. I was having uh, tendon problems. Um, I had surgery on my knee um, and then I came back to training. I had a hand injury. I was out for another four to six weeks. And, um, and where were you at in your career at this point? I was youth pro, like a first or second year pro. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this was probably my worst time of injuries, to be honest, because I wasn't certain about what I was doing. I weren't certain I was I had, I had a career in football. Right. And all I wanted to do was kind of get training again. Uh, I just couldn't get fit. And I, then I remember coming back from my hand and then I was at my mum's. Uh, I was living at my mum's, I think, still, yeah. And um, I was carrying my sister in and then I, I fell down the path and then done my ankle ligaments and then um carrying your sister carrying my sister to the door yeah well, how how old or big is she yeah, seven 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 she was young yeah like young enough for me to be carrying anyway and um yeah i actually cried that actually cried that when i got on the sofa i was just like pain or you just knew but i just knew again that like, i was in trouble yeah. um and like i was just frustrated I'd been injured back to back and now I'm out again for another but I felt like you felt when you do your ligaments you feel like you've broke your ankle and um you feel like it's worse than it is. Yeah. Um but it I kind of them always looked at it as an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, when I got injured because I can start to work on something that I wouldn't be able to work on if I was training. And that's kind of my attitude to sort of being injured that I can do something that I couldn't do while I was training. Right. And I'd, all, I, I'd take up an interest as I got a bit older and got injuries. So whether that would be yoga or the Watt bike, I was obsessed by the Watt bike for a, a little stint that I had injury for two months, right. three months. Me and um, Tommy Rowe, another lad who was injured at the same time, he had a great attitude as well. Um, we, we'd just be on the Watt bike every day doing different drills and I kind of, Felt like it was always an opportunity to do to to come back and improve. Where did you get this attitude from? Because this, no doubt, has helped you be sitting here, looking and being how you are today with what you've been through. But like, 
that attitude, you can't be taught that, and that attitude doesn't just come at 16 when all of a sudden you're interested in football. Where, where's that come from? Because without that, like, there's just so many things that can knock you back, but it sounds like consistently, whatever knockback it was, your attitude was like, all right, cool, I can, what to do from here? Yeah, I kind of feel like... You can't teach it, that. It was probably like growing up hum with, like, not humble beginnings and just having a, a, a state, council state, I kind of felt that my mum always, my mum always worked hard and she was tough. Yeah. And I kind of always kind of felt that even though my dad was seen as like a sort of man's man, it was always my mum that was, my mum's the real tough one really. Yeah. And I kind of felt like it was from my mum and my mum's attitude. Um, and it was always kind of taught, always told, you have to work harder. You have to work harder. You can't. Um, I remember it was probably, and it still might be relevant today in, in some uh, circumstances. I remember having a com my mum having a conversation with me when I was about 10. Yeah. Saying that you're always going to have to work harder than other people. Like your skin doesn't allow you to have that privilege. Mm -hmm. And it was always kind of told that if you're going for the same job, you better work 10 times harder. And I, f I don't know if it, little things like that and little things like seeing my mum work at a chip shop and yeah. just my whole family was kind of, there wasn't necessarily uh, in my immediate family and not in a disrespectful way, like skilled, skilled people. It was more hard graft, right, yes. with grafters like, yeah. and I feel like that's where it kind of came from and it kind of, that's how it sort of embedded in me yeah. being football and then I sort of remember one pre-season and just the park, I'll just keep running and keep running and keep running. And I kind of question whether I actually was ever fit or that I just never you just kept going. Yeah. And that's kind of how I've yes. always tried to be throughout yeah. my career and life really. Yeah. That's a great attitude. Yeah. Great. It's a great one. I think, uh, you know, similar, you know, my mum had a similar thing. She said, you've always got to be two steps ahead because if you're one step ahead, they catch up. And I think for, you know, a 10 year old, that's, you know, when you see, you see that it's, you know, it's, it sticks with you. It, it, it's, uh, it's incredible now to think about it that, she, obviously my mum's white as well. So her having that conversation with her half African kid, mm -hmm. that she felt like she had to say that. And like you said, it came from love. It wasn't a threat. Yeah. It was, you have, to, you have to be better. You have to do more. You have to work harder. And that kind of stuck with me, along with her attitude as well. Her, my mum's attitude is just, she's just tough. I imagined being a footballer, not, I didn't think I was going to be a footballer at all. Yeah. Like footballers were something that I used to see on TV, really. And the only time I seen them was my imagination playing at a, our estate, we had like flats everywhere and we had a little green, a bit of green grass there and that was what called Wembley. And that's kind of, that was my imagination. I never was out there because I felt like I was trying to be a footballer. I just, I love being, playing football and yeah. it would be great if I could be, but it wasn't the main driving message. I think when my mum told me that or when my dad pointed out things to me in life that wasn't, always fair but that's the way it was when you, you had the certain conversations that you have um, growing up it was just the fact that they did say yeah just work hard at whatever you do just work hard at it and you might just succeed or yeah. you might get that breakthrough that we never had and I think that as parents that's all you really yeah. want yeah. is that uh, your kids have more than or a better life yeah. than you had really. Who was the villa? A uh, hero for you back then? Uh, it would have been um, uh, Dalian Atkinson, yeah. Right. Dalian Atkinson okay. was uh, my hero, and Paul McGrath. Okay. Paul McGrath, and um, I'd, obviously I admired the goalkeepers. Uh, Mark Bosnich uh, was, was in goal, and Nigel Spinks. Um, yeah. But it was funny, I actually seen Nigel Spinks in the coffee shop probably about a month ago, and I felt a bit weird yeah. like, for the first time. <laughs> You know, I don't really get like struck or anything like that. Or um, I, like, lost for words. Yeah, I was just yeah. kind of like, let's not just think. Right. And, I just, and that was the first time 
I can actually remember me thinking, me, I felt a bit fluttered. Fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, um, highlights from the playing career. Oh, because I want to touch on that hand injury, um, half, the, the half-time injury. I don't think that's one of my highlights. <laughs> but that was the second part of the double relegation, actually. And um, it would, uh, we've been going through a rough patch, really. Um, and Dean Saunders came in, who I had at Doncaster anyway. And uh, I, I do like Dean, like I, I will go on record to say that. But um, he, uh, he's training, he tried to change everything at the time, which... I kind of understand why he did because everything was stale. Yeah. So he changed his office, his, all the offices were upstairs. He changed his office to like um, a u little utility room that we had downstairs. So he was trying to change things. But he was kind of sometimes we, um, I, 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 and everyone's different, but I just like to know what we were doing. So I'd like to, I'd like a schedule. I'd like to know if we're training at 10 30. A goalkeeper will probably take it worse than any outfield player because we are, a lot of us are. We do think like that. We like routine. We like to know that we've done these certain things. Really? Yeah. Never. <laughs> yeah, we like to tick our boxes. Um, and then uh, sort of, it was just, there was a lot going on at Wolves. Uh, we were struggling and I'd probably taking it personally as well. I, I felt like I was having a good season myself, but it was tough. Um, and I'd been at Wolves for, since I was 14. Wolves is my club, it still is. And, we were struggling and um, a lot was a lot was going on. We changed managers. We were in trouble, um, and we'd uh, we'd been sort of playing out from the back. And uh, Dean was like, um, "If anything goes wrong, then it's all right. Blame, blame me." Um, we probably wasn't technically good enough to be playing out from the back, um, and yeah, we um, we. Bristol City came and uh, played a ball to uh, Dave Davis, my mate, and um, he, he played one back, which had quite a bit of spin on it. I think any <laughs> cricketer would have been happy with it. He's right down the middle of my goal. And I had one of them ball probably two weeks early against Leeds on my left foot. I had Jamie whipped, uh, Jamie O'Hara whipped a ball back in the middle of my goal on my left foot, sort of knee height. And it's not the ball you want to be taking in the middle of your goal. I'm sure nowadays and Hart would probably deal with it a lot easier than I would. But um, it, it was just sort of, I remember speaking to the goalkeeper coach saying, that was a bit risky, that was. I'm not sure I don't want to be taking that. But um, anyway, Dave played the ball back. It span and went into the net. Um, and coming through the, coming back in the half time. And you, <laughs> You, you know you've made a mistake. You kind of want the ground to swallow you up a little bit. You're defiant to say that I'm going to show everyone. Score at this point? 1-0, Bristol okay. City. Yeah. Okay. So you just like, oh man, that night. And then you sort of get into the change room and when you've made a mistake like that, no one needs to tell you. You know, you know what's happened. And um, obviously Dean's under a lot of pressure at the time. And like a lot of managers do, start going off at me um so he started saying what what, the, what are you doing uh, blah 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 um so i'm just sort of sitting there i'm probably sitting here like this really uh like boiling inside <laughs> like boiling sort of drinking my water then said something else and then bottle just flew across the room sort of got up and then you threw the bottle yeah, threw the bottle across the room then um, we just started having a go at each other. Um, and then it was just escalating, people getting involved, which when sort of you, when I've got the red mist anyway, I don't want no one to touch me. Yeah. And we are just arguing. It all kind of got separated in a way and the, the room was clear. And um, just in frustration, there was a tactics board um, there and um, I've just whacked the tactics board, um, but I didn't realise there was a probably three, four inch metal bar running straight down the middle of it. Um, and sort of went to walk to the bathroom, Bry, uh, the coach who I really like as well, 
um, he said, uh, you should have done that when you was out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, come back in for seconds and I had a bit of a go at Bri, which kind of happens in the change room and then sort of went down, um, went to sit in the toilet to kind of have peace in my own space. Um, and then I remember just I, I, in tears really with anger, it's just emotional. Right. Um, and uh, after sort of a couple of minutes, hand was starting to hum a little bit. Um, Did you hit it hard then? Yeah, I, I didn't think about just giving it a, a, a little just jab. Yeah, I just, I just whacked it right. um, and sort of took my glove off. And then my hand was up here. And then I was like, oh, I'm in trouble, man. I don't think I can go out with this. Went to try and stick my glove back on. It wouldn't go on. Um, and then went to see the doc and he told me I've got to go straight to hospital uh, just in case uh, there was a clotting or something was going on in your hand. Um, so obviously I had to come off at half time, which didn't stay a secret for that long because the whole stewards heard everything that was going on in the change room and news, news travels fast. And um, yeah, then I was ended up sort of making my my dad wanted to show to pull my dad in. Um, so obviously I'm upset, angry anyway. And then I got my dad saying, "What are you doing?" Like, and I'm just like, "Dad, I don't need not not now." Do you know what I mean? Uh, and then I'm on my way to hospital, and then I'm thinking. This, is, this ain't good, this ain't good. How long did that keep you out for? Um, I was out for the rest of the yeah. season. That was so, in March? Yeah, I was in so, March, yeah, yeah. So I was out for three months, yeah. Right. And um, I remember coming back into Wolves. I'd had my operation the next day. Right. Um, I remember coming back into Wolves a week or two later, having to, it's, it's a horrible feeling, thinking I've got to go and see the manager. And um, then I'm thinking he's going to try and find me. And then I'm thinking I'm going to argue again, with have a little argument about that. So what, are you, are you an angry man at this moment in time? Is this the, is this the world against you? Where's your, where's your head at? No, it wasn't the world against me at all. It was just um, frustrated about what was going on. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you still managed to step away from it and be like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah I was like frustrated about our, our form like the team, everyone's included in that, um, that we were losing a lot of games. What did you need at that point? Have you ever, have you ever worked with anyone, you know, mental coach, psychologist, that, you know, at that point? Do you mean to not hit the tactics board or to... Well, uh, yeah, in, in, cause you know. That's, a, about... that's a calculated hit though. Cause I was speaking to Jamie about this. Like if you saw a metal bar, you're not giving, which hand was it? This one, yeah, my right. You're not, you're not giving a metal bar a right hook, are you? Like, m me, if I really lose my head, I, I've, kicked, I've kicked the goal so many times, but I move, like, I really want to kick it, but I'm, I'm, I put my studs, some, all my studs are there, and I, and I hit it head on. Yeah. So I get my frustration out, but I know I'm never going to hurt myself. It's yeah. not like I'm volleying a post. Yeah, it's not like I punched a wall. Yeah. yeah. I don't think m nothing would have changed that much in that instance yeah. of time and that point in my life. Um, I don't think any, so a lot of psychologists throughout my career heavily believed in that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just raw emotion, raw anger yeah, that was just in the moment. So the lesson from it was, yes, I can get angry. It's an appropriate emotion at an appropriate time. But you just have to know that there's consequences to hitting something physical which many people, you can hit somebody and then, you know, you can, like you said, if somebody wanted to fight you at that time, you would have, you would have done that. But there's also consequences to that. So that's what I was interested in is what did you learn from it? Yeah, I learned a lot. I, di I didn't think of any consequences at the time. Well, maybe I did because maybe I would have hit Dean. Do you know what I mean? And then I would have definitely been sacked. Yeah. So there was definitely thought in there, but, and I knew that I can't have a fight with a manager but 
and I'd never do that because I've got respect for it. I've got yeah. respect for Dean, and Dean was probably someone that I'd watched at Villa when I was a kid as well. So yeah. um, it was more the fact that I just felt like I needed. I don't, I don't know if I felt like I needed anything, but I just it just was a release at the time, and that's why I'd done it. But I think learning from that, um, it definitely made me think differently about anger, about striking out, and about how I how I use my anger in a better way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of something when I started speaking to um, Dave Young, who was a, a sports psychiatrist when mm -hmm. who came into Wolves, mm -hmm. we really spoke and I told him my personality and what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And we kind of spoke about when are you at your best? Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt like it was always a, a point where I was aggressive, but not too aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I was calm, but not too relaxed and trying to find that balance where it yeah. kind of met the point where it was, it worked for me. Yeah. And being overly aggressive or too calm was, was no good. So it was just a way of really me expressing my emotions and trying to not to say that I'd still get angry and I still would get angry now, do you know what I mean? It yeah. still points to that, but it's just how to manage that really. And I think that's kind of what I, I learned. <laughs>